Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, I'm not a pastor. But uh, yeah, we're going to go old school today, I think, a little bit. And uh, we're going to open up our Bibles. Let's open up to 1 Kings, chapter 16. And we're going to start with a verse 29. I have two um, uh, stories that I love in the Bible, and this is one of them. The other one being when Abraham was before God at the, uh, at the cherubim tree, and uh, the terebinth tree, and speaking directly to the Son of God. But this is another story I really like, and so I thought it would be a good thing to go through and do a little bit of a Bible study today. So starting with 1 Kings chapter 16 and uh, verse 29. And in the 38th and eighth year of Azah, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omer, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omer, Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And he took a wife to, to Jezebel. The daughter of Ethel, king of the Zidonians, went and served Baal and worshipped him. What was his problem? What was Ahab's problem? What did he end up doing? Went away from God. He turned to the heathens for a wife, Jezebel. Of course, we know Jezebel being quite the evil lady that she was. But it said, it's interesting here. It says, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's not a good thing. Here's what Patriarchs and Prophets says. Taking to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of Zidonians, and the priest of Baal, Ahab served Baal and worshipped him. And, reared, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. We have a problem here. We're serving other gods. This is supposed to be the king. Not only did Ahab introduce Baal worship at the capital city, but under the leadership of Jezebel, he erected heathen altars in many high places, where in the shelter of the surrounding groves, the priests and others connected with a seductive form of idolatry exerted their baleful influence until well nigh all Israel were following after Baal. Mm, that's not a good sign. And if we turn over here to chapter 17, as we kind of get some, a little bit of a background to this story that we're going to be talking about in verse 18. Verse 17, verse 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be a dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get ye then, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the book Cherith, that, be, that is before Jordan. So here we, we have Elijah saying there's not going to be dew, there's not going to be rain. He's going to pray to famine. And if we come down to verse or chapter 18, actually, verse 1, we turn over to 18, and it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. So why was there a famine? If we go back to ch uh, chapter 17 here, what had happened? Yeah, no do, no rain. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel had cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a, hun a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave. And fed them with bread and water. I was here and I was listening to a sermon that talked about that possibly since he was the governor of the house, he most likely took from Jezebel's table to feed the prophets. High, high, interesting irony that would be. Um, as we go down to uh, verse 17, this is where it's going to get interesting. Because we have, we have Ahab, or Ahab the king. We have Elijah coming to Ahab. And we have this interaction here between Ahab and Elijah. It's, it's very, very interesting. Verse 17 of chapter 18. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? 
<laughs> so the king here is blaming Elijah for the famine. Though if we read back here, who is to blame for the famine? Ahab and his fathers. Here's what Patriarchs and Prophets says. Ellen White says on this verse 18. Uh, actually, let's, let's read verse 18 and then I'll do the comment. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. This is uh, Elijah. But thou and thy father's house, in thee that the, the, ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and has offered, and has followed Balaam. And here's what Patriarchs and Prophets says. Elijah makes no attempt to excuse himself or to flatter the king. Nor does he seek to evade the king's wrath by good news that the drought is almost over. He has no apology to offer. Indignant and jealous for the honor of God, he casts back the imputation of Ahab, fearlessly declaring to the king that it is his sins and the sins of his fathers that have brought upon Israel that terrible calamity. You know, it says that in the Bible that sins go back to the third, fourth, fifth generation. Um, you know, things that can happen in our lives, a lot of times we can blame our, our lineage. Um, and in some ways, probably so. That uh, we're like our fathers. Our fathers are like <coughs> their fathers. And so this is what's happening in the uh, kingdom of Israel. And if we follow over here to verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all the Israel unto Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which ate at Jezebel's table. Something interesting here, the word groves, and this was mentioned earlier. Um, the groves were an interesting place. It would be an open section inside of a uh, wilderness or a uh, forested area. It is interesting there's a grove today where people go to worship. Anybody heard of the Bohemian Grove? Mm -hmm. A few people. This is in Northern California. They worship a 40-foot owl. And the reason we know that is because somebody actually got it. It's very high, heavily, heavily fortified. Um, and you can't get in there very easily. Somebody did, and they videotaped it, and they were worshiping a 40-foot owl. Um, very interesting that that grove worship is still going on today, Baal worship. And, it's, and uh, uh, let's go to verse 20. So Abraham, Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long, this is interesting, this is very key here, this is key for us also. How long halt ye between two opinions? And that's what God is asking us today. How long are we going to halt between two ideas? Whether we're going to worship God or we're going to worship man. And we're, we're faced with that every single day of our life. Are we going to worship God or are we going to worship man? And, uh, and Elijah came to the people and said, how long, how long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. What did, what did Elijah just do there? Kind of a, kind of a little bit of a test, right? Yeah. He says, if, 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 basically, if, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is, follow him. He's setting up a test here. He's setting up uh, a situation. Here's what uh, Ellen White says on this in Patriarchs and Prophets, and I, and I encourage you to get by that or to get that book. I think we might have some back there. Patriarchs and Prophets goes over a number of these areas. In this book, she says the people answered Elijah not a word. Not one in that vast assembly dare reveal <clears throat> loyalty to Jehovah. Each departure, why would they not? They want somebody didn't want to be the outcast, right? In your group of people, you don't want to be that lone wolf, that lone person that is different than all the others. But we have that in Scripture. I mean, we have the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three out of everybody of the governors of uh, Babylon, they stood up. Only three. Um, each departure from right doing, each refusal to repent, had deepened their guilt and driven them further from heaven. These are uh, the people of Israel. And now in this crisis, they're persisted in refusing to take their stand for God. They refused to stand for God. That should be a wake-up call for us. Are we, a lot of times, refusing to stand for God? When trials hit us, are we refusing to stand? Because there's going to come a time when we're going to have to stand. And it's, right. it's going to be two camps. That's right. And we're going to be one of those camps. Either God or Satan. 
The Lord abhors indifference and disloyalty in a time of crisis in his work. And let me tell you, there is a time of crisis coming. And the way she says here, an indifference and a disloyalty in a time of crisis in his work, he abhors it. That's a negative, that's a pretty uh, negative word, right? Abhorring? If you abhor something, you kind of hate it, right? <clears throat> then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain of the prophet of the Lord. This is verse 22. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. What had Jezebel done to the other, the other prophets? It killed most of them. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces. And this is key, I mean, you need to look at this real carefully. Cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood. And put no, what? Fire under it. Why? Yeah, it's a test, yeah. He's not trusting these guys, is he? Okay. I will dress the other bullock, lay it on the wood, and I will put no fire under it. Okay. So he's trying to make this an even Stephen, this is an even um, uh, call here. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the, and the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And the people answered and said, it is well spoken. This is um, an interesting situation here where Elijah has really put himself... <laughs> First of all, Elijah had a lot of faith, right? What's the faith of Elijah right here? In, in a time of crisis, he's up against Jezebel's uh, prophets. And Jezebel's wanting to kill him. And here, here he is uh, really creating a situation that if his faith was not what it was, he's going to be killed. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose ye a bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal. And this is interesting. From morning even until noon. So they're calling and repeating, No, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, oh, Baal. Saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar, which was made. <laughs> you ever read this and, and, and get a visual? I'm a visual person, and so I get this visual in my mind of people leaping and crazy up on top of this altar and doing all crazy uh, things and just crying out and crying out to Baal. And this is kind of the imagery you get from this text, right? And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. And this is very fascinating, uh, what Elijah does here. It, you know, in our, in our lives, if we mock somebody, you know, it's kind of demeaning to them, correct? Yeah. But here we got, we got something interesting. Um, and at noon, Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he is pursuing. It's interesting, I looked up at another um, uh, translation that pursuing actually was the same as relieving yourself. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the translation. Or he is in a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. Wow, he's really doing some mocking here. <laughs> um, and they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Let's go over to Leviticus 19.28 real quick. Um, put your, uh, hold your thought here at verse 28. So Leviticus 19.28. So Leviticus 19.28 Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor paint, print any marks upon you, for I am the Lord. So these, these prophets are cutting themselves, they're, they're defying God, they're, they're doing everything that is repulsive to God. And uh, and it came to pass, when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer it, nor any that regarded it. So they're not getting an answer from Baal, are they? No answer at all. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 
It's interesting, he took 12 stones, according to the number of tribes of, of the sons of Jacob, mm -hmm. to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. 12 stones, and these stones were unhewn stones. So what was the altar that was before God? It had to be made of unhewn stones. Why? Anybody have an idea? Maybe <coughs> unhewn stones. Does it have anything to do with what man does? Exactly. <coughs> and what, yeah, and, and exactly. When we see a human altar, it's usually of hewn, squared, or rectangle stones. This was unhewn stones saying that this was something not man. A man did not carve or make um, to use as the altar. Very, very important. Uh, it's 12 stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, verse 31. Unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about it. And this is, this is probably the fast, most fascinating part of this story, because this is an impossibility that he's creating here. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the bird sacrifice and on the wood. Now we've all made a, 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 a campfire, right? If I told you, let's, let's put the wood on there, and we're going to drench the thing with water. You'd think I was crazy, right? Absolutely nuts, because water does not, and it, even if you have a wood that's got a little water in it, what does it do? It pops and cracks, and it's kind of a neat, you know, it's neat at a, at a campfire, but if it's got too much water in it, it doesn't burn. So he's creating an impossibility here. <laughs> Four barrels of water, and, and put in verse, uh, actually verse 34, sorry. And he said, do it a second time. So not just the first time, but we've got a second time he's wanting to make sure. Also, this is creating an impossibility, but yet it's, it's going to build some faith here, too. And they, they, and they did it a second time. This is verse 34. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it the third time. So here's three times you're drenching. So you, pretty much this is soaked wood, correct? This altar is soaked. And it came to pass after <clears throat> this verse 36. Oh, sorry, verse 35. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So there's water around it. There's water over being poured over it. So this is a, a, a situation that shouldn't burn, correct? Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening, evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came there and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things in thy word. This is an interesting passage. and um, you, If you look back through here, it says, uh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jeff, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. What is he just doing right there? He's acknowledging who? God. Somebody other than himself. Because he's not going to be the one to create this fire or this altar to be burned. Um, and then he says, uh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant. This is very important. This is something I've been studying lately about being a servant to others, and uh, especially as a husband. I know it would be interesting, you know, Pastor, when he speaks about marriage, um, especially to you guys. Being a servant husband to your wife. Serve her. Um, this is your duty as a, as, a, as a man, as a Christian man. So here is this servant mentality that he had. Very humble. Correct. As he's coming before God. Okay. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord. So now he's pleading. He's, he's going to God. Hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consuming the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, if you're the prophets of Baal, you've been doing this all day long, cutting yourself, living upon the altar, you're looking at this going, what just happened? Right? Just imagine yourself there. You're seeing this fire come down from heaven, licking up, really, you're, you're first of all, you're, what, what is Elijah doing with the water all over the, what, is he crazy? 
And then you see the, the, the fire come down from heaven, licking it all up, burning the rock, the dust, the water, everything, and consuming it. This is, this is the great God we, we serve. Amen. Um, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Where was their faith, though? They had to see to believe, correct? They're like a doubt, doubting Thomas. They had to see something, and then they turn back to God. This is something for us to think about. Do we have to see to believe, or do we just uh, step out on faith? Step out in faith. Yeah. And in verse 40, it says, And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them over there. And uh, that's the end result for... Uh, Doing things that, is, that are important to God. And it's interesting, if you go back, we won't go there, but Deuteronomy 13.5, if you put that in your notes here, uh, there is a reason why he killed them. Because they were dreamers, they were prophets, prophets of Baal. And these, according to Deuteronomy, God had told them, you have to kill them. So it was very important that he ended up uh, getting rid of them. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Go thee up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. This is a very humble man right here. And he said to his servant, Go, ye, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked. And he said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time. Have you ever interested how many times seventh comes up in the Bible? Seven times around Jericho. Here's seven times. God has, what does seven mean? Complete. The number. Complete. Complete. Completeness. Perfection. God, on God's terms. What, and of course, six is, one shy of seven is man. And I, you know, we, we always, uh, the world gets fascinated over 666 and you know, it's, there are God put meaning to these these numbers. And it came to pass, and this is verse 44, at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there riseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. You know, we're told that uh, Christ's coming will be like that. <clears throat> a little hand, the size of a man's hand. And he said, Go up unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot, get thee down, and the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Well, I wasn't going to have any uh, slides, but uh, there's a picture, kind of a picture of, uh, of that... Uh, Bullock and the and the trench and the fire coming down from heaven. Just to give you, this is an interesting uh, picture. This is the traditional spot of where this supposed, supposedly happened. Uh, they actually believe it's probably farther down near a spring because remember he gathered barrels of water, so it had to be water nearby. Matter of fact, Mount Carmel does overlook the Mediterranean Sea. I doubt they actually ran all the way down to the sea to get the water and bring it up. This is uh, uh, overlooking Haifa in Israel. This is the shrine of the Bab. The Bab El uh, Bab Ullah is his name. Interesting, this is from the Baha'i Faith. Okay, the Baha'i Faith was started in 1844. Whoa. Very fascinating. I, I think I've done a sermon, uh, a few sermons ago about what happened in 1844. There's a number of things that, that occurred in 1844, communism, a number of different things. But this is the Baha'i Faith, the Bab, which actually translated the gate. Who is the gate? Jesus. Jesus is the gate. So this is another gate. And if you, uh, I think I got the next slide here. It's kind of interesting. I kind of blew it up. I don't know some symbolism. These, this is a, actually the Baha'i faith is interesting because it is uh, the faith of the United Nations. It is the faith that is being used by the United Nations to bring all the religions together into one corporate, one world religion. And they're using the Baha'i faith to do it. In this, I kind of blew it up a little bit. You can actually see down here uh, two eagles on each side opposing each other. This is like the two-headed eagle. Um, you actually see the uh, 
uh, triangles at the top of the eye in it, the eye of Horus. So you have all this symbolism there. You know, the occult and these different faiths, they're all, you can link them together within five minutes with their symbols. Um, this is another one that's fascinating. This is looking part of the gardens area. I, I think, I believe you can see the Mediterranean over there it overlooks. This is built near or on Mount Carmel. This is in defiance of God, really what I feel. Um, the middle portion here is kind of fascinating. Uh, that's an eight-pointed star. You find that same symbolism in the Vatican. If you look down from Google Earth, you'll see the Vatican with an eight-pointed star with the, the uh, obelisk sitting in the middle of phallic worship. This is really just another way of doing it. This is Baal. This is the. This is very fascinating. I can't Well, it was interesting this morning, uh, about five o'clock in the morning, I got the text from uh, from pastor, uh, thinking, well, we, does anyone, would anyone, your elders want to do it? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> um, so I just kind of put a few little things together here this morning. But this is one ball. Very interesting. Look at this. You can't read this. So I'll read it. It says it's the storm god. What were the prophets of Baal trying to invoke? Rain. Well, it had rain, right? What did God do? This is the same thing that God did with the Egyptians. The Nile god, the frogs, these were all worshipped by the Egyptians. This ball is a storm god. is represented holding a club in his left hand. It gets better. The lance extends toward in the form of a tree or a stylized lightning found at Raj Chamara in 1932. So this is a stone. Uh, lightnings and thunders, God created the rain. Uh, at the time of, when Elijah was going with, uh, with Ahab, I'm sorry, uh, with Ahab, and it rained finally. Here's the God. God is going, I'm the God that you should be serving, not Baal. The God, this is actually, they would worship God also as a fertility God. And this is uh, uh, the same stella on the left there with a couple of the little little gods there. That's actually Baal. Those are, those are the originals. Um, real quick here. So in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, here's what um, Malachi says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And of course, we've all heard that. And the power of Elijah, we believe, is added as the Elijah message. Really, ultimately, is on the screen the three angels' message. Um, there's 12 points here. These are 12 characteristics, real quick, of the Elijah message. And this is very fascinating. So, Elijah, um, a type of Elijah was John the Baptist. We know that. Um, through scripture. John was most likely, he, he was the one that was referring to in Malachi. And it says here, they were both bold, this is John the Baptist and Elijah, bold and fearless in preaching even before kings. We have John going to Herod talking about his brother's wife. We have Elijah, obviously, what we read. Yes. And uh, yes. this comes from Mark chapter 13, verse 9. You shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. So it's a similarity. This is, this is something that affects us because of it, one of, you know, some of us may have to go and talk and speak before kings. What you know, as, an, as a Seventh-day Adventist, three, part of the three angels' message, you just never know. Number two, they had a simple diet and a lifestyle. So Elijah ate morsel of bread, John, of course, ate locusts and wild honey. And it says here, likewise, the church in the last days must be revived to the truth so that a strong connection links the body and spirit. What we eat and drink as well as our personal living habits have a direct effect on our mental clarity and ability to discern the truth. So this has a, 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 a parallel to us today. Uh, number three, they dressed in modest, simple clothing. Uh, Elijah, he was a hairy man with a garment of hair and girt with girdle. John was clothed with camel's hair. Um, and the, the parallel with us is, you know, it talks about in 1 Timothy, well, actually, yeah, 1 Timothy 2.9, in like manner, women also adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, 
shamefacedness, and sobriety, not with braided hair, gold pearls, or costly arrays. So it's just a, a, another way of paralleling um, the first two Elijahs. Uh, number four, they believed in dis discipling others. And of course, we know Elijah did uh, with Elisha, uh, departed and found Elisha. Um, and of course, John had disciples that eventually became Christ's disciples. And what is it? What's our mission? To disciple others for, for Christ, right? So this parallels again. Number five, they preached a baptism of repentance and death to self. This is an interesting, this is an important one too, because we're told to die to self. Um, number six, they both, this is John and Elijah, manifested humility. And we saw a very humble man in, in Elijah. John was also humble. He says, he that his Matthew, from Matthew 3.11, I'm talking about John. He that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. That's a very humble heart. This is what God asks us to be also, is to be humble and, hum and have humility. Number seven, they both endured religious persecution. And of course, we know that uh, uh, the persecution experienced by Elijah and John will soon be repeated. In the last days, Revelation tells us the mother of harlots and her daughters will persecute God's remnant people the last day Elijah's. They both ran before the king. Both Elijah and John uh, ran before the king. And uh, we have the for Revelation 14, 6, where I saw another angel in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So again, this is a chance that we may be before kings. Number nine, they were both supremely interested in glorifying God. And shouldn't that be our mission today, too, is to glorify God? We behoove us to, to be very careful how we portray ourselves to others. Uh, we're to be a light to the world. You know, we're not to, to bring people into darkness and, and have darkness in our life also. Uh, we're supposed to be glorifying God. Number ten, they repaired the altar of God. Both Elijah and John. John... Um, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's really what we're supposed to be doing also um, in these last days. Their messages sparked revival and reformation, um, both Elijah and uh, John. And that's the same thing with these three angels' messages. These are a warning to the world. These are a warning that it, it's interesting that there's... Uh, Ellen White talks about that uh, there's going to be a time when there's going to be people going, why didn't you tell me that this was going to happen? And if we don't tell our brothers and sisters and our, our relatives and our neighbors about this warning in a kind, loving manner, in a, in a, in a uh, kind of a humility, if you, if you want to say. Um, number 12, the Elijah message will point people to Christ. That's the most important thing. Here's Elijah from 1 Kings 18, 36. It says, Elijah the prophet came here and said, Lord God, Abraham, Isaac, of Israel, let me know this day that thou art God. So he's, he's pointing to God as king. John, in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. So he's pointing to Christ. Both are pointing to Christ. And this is what we, the burning desire of modern Elijahs will be to turn people to Jesus that they might know him and have everlasting life. Amen. That's really important. You know, in, these, in this day and age, we have an Elijah message. We have a message to give to the world. Are we going to hide it under a bushel? As that little, I remember that song as a kid. Don't lie it under a bushel, no. Or are we going to preach it to the world? And tell the world, tell our neighbors, our, our friends, tell them. And, and, and you're asking, what do I tell them? What do I say? Tell them about the love of Christ. Start with the love of God. Well, how has Christ worked in your life? How, how is he changing? I'll tell you this morning, it was fascinating. After I got the, uh, the uh, text um, and I got to church, my voice started to go. And I just simply just started praying about it. And no reason at all that my voice should start going. Um, and, of course, we had some other issues and stuff, but um, simply get down, pray about it. Pray about a neighbor, a neighbor that you haven't been able to talk to uh, about it. Pray about it and uh, 
Through that prayer, God will help you find a way, a tactful way to tell them about the good news of Christ. So, the three angels' messages definitely are our calling. Uh, we need to tell the word, uh, world and warn them about it, uh, this Elijah message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much, Lord, that you're our God. That you hear us even though that we, we fail, we're sinners, but you still love us and your mercy is your mercy is there for us but Lord we have to ask for it we have to seek it we have to ask Father in a submissive role that will submit totally to you Lord as we go from this place be with us, encourage us and those that aren't with us today Lord be with them, guide, direct them uh, help them to feel better uh, the sickness Lord we realize that Satan can can bring this upon people in a heartbeat and inflict this upon them to keep them away from you. And uh, we just bind, uh, we just ask that you bind Satan in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.